London, eight million people in a city 2,000 years old. Until recently, the capital of the largest empire the world has ever known. When you come here as a foreigner, you feel saturated in human action, or traces of it, piled up solid by Londoners over centuries. Even in a row on the Thames, the muck in the river somehow, obscurely, seems much older than muck in any other city. But in the last few years, a new London seems to have been born, at least in the minds of foreigners. This new look came from America. Americans had always doted on traditional London. And now, in the notorious words of Time magazine, London has burst into bloom, it swings, it is switched on. Everything new, uninhibited and kinky is blooming at the top of London life. It's fantastic, really. I love it very much and all the persons I know yeah. Some magazines were unenthusiastic. The atmosphere in London, one of them said, can be almost eerie in its relentless frivolity. Britain seems willing to sink, giggling, into the sea. But what did Londoners think? Well, I think that every city has its time for about two years at a time, and I think about five years ago it was Rome, and now it's London. I think young people are much more... much able, more able to enjoy themselves, and I think the fun people... Chelsea is very gay. Yes. I think it's great for them. I think it's become, the press has caused it to be a slightly more concentrated sort of swingingness. I mean, it's much more commercial than it ever was before. Well, I think this, this is something, you know, that has been a marvellous contract, you know, sort of organised in a way, um, in which, you know, particularly the younger teenagers in this country have been made up, you know, by the people that run fashion and pop business and by the newspaper men, so they themselves have come to believe it. I think it's the image of the miniskirts and the, and the, the pretty... Carnaby Street and things like that. I think that's what makes London swinging. Well, I, I'm a sort of a suburban housewife. I, um, it's this swing in London really doesn't interest me. I would say there is, yes. Yes. We're getting away. We've got to go on, haven't we? You don't go back. I would say there is. Yes, there's a new vogue coming out. Yes. I'm all for it, Michelle. There is no one London. Everyone who lives here has his own city. And there are just as many Londons as there are Londoners, or for that matter, visitors. Now I come to London for two or three days at a time as a visiting journalist from Paris. This capital to me is too often the official business London of politics, newspapers and theatres. It's not artificial, not unreal, but it's limited, uh, over-focused on personalities, uh, official events, over-rapid to... I don't really know enough real Londoners. Who built the canal? The French and the British. Who controls it? <laughs> Who built Havana? The Americans. Who got it? Castro. <laughs> Who's building Africa? The whites. Who's going to get it? The blacks. <laughs> Who built Oxford Street? The English. Who controls it? The Jews. <laughs> <laughs> Who built Buckingham Palace? The English. Who lives there? A Greek. <laughs> As a black South African living in exile, I find this a vastly comic open-air cabaret show. Yet beneath all that mock insult against the English, these blacks state the terms on which they would like to be accepted into English society. They know they have something unique to contribute. They want to be accepted, but they are not buying British at all costs. And I want you to listen. Bye, bye. You don't have to be 
I live here instead of Australia because I make my living writing about art. If you want to talk about world art centres, there are only two, here and New York. Perhaps London's a bit too bland, but on the balance I do prefer it to the States. The material you have to work with here is very rich indeed. I like what English painters are doing, and I collect their pictures. London's totally, completely eclectic, and anything seems at least three quarters possible. I can only write about the paintings that interest me strongly, and a lot of English art at the moment does. London looks like developing into a better place for young artists than it's ever been since the war, and that is another reason to stay. You're bombarded with sensations the whole time, things that demand to be evaluated. Actually, my big interest is the Italian Renaissance, and London has the great advantage of being 11,000 miles closer to my flat in Italy than Sydney is. Today we've all come together to look at this other London, the one the foreign magazines saw. And we'll spend the day at it, beginning in Carnaby Street. The irony is that Carnaby Street, the mecca of swinging London, should be so tawdry and dull. The only thing colourful about it is the clothes. sort of mini Carnaby Street in Paris, where they sell English stuff. There's even one in Rome. When I first saw the London Carnaby Street, uh, I was fascinated. But now, really, I find it a bit grubby. advertising the Kiva Quasa. And yet, uh, you've taken it out straight, and at Victorian, during Victorian times, one feels that this was, you know, a straight advertisement. And you give yes. it a slightly clear well, it's, it's connotation. A, Why? It's a change of sense of humor now. People find it amusing now, whereas it was a straight advertisement once. We found a lot of people buying the old Victorian things because of what was written on them. So now we have them done on almost everything. I'm told that uh, some of these motifs, uh, the designs, don't sell so well and yet others, you know, sell like hotcakes. Oh. Yes. Why? Well, there's actually kinky ones. That's a mouth with lots of straps. Oh, the lady with the straps all <laughs> over her bust, yes. Yes, that does. Yes, that does. Very good stuff. What the hell do you have here, you and Jack, all over the place? Oh, we're proud to be British. Come on. What is it, fundamentally? Nostalgia for the Empire? Uh, yes, it is. 
that's a good point, because it's a Boer War tea caddy which has been reproduced very much nostalgia, which makes people buy it quite a lot. What? And the Union people, Jack... What kind of people? A terrific variety of people, young people and old people who surely can remember mean the original. Anything from a char lady to a task girl, no? Yes, yes, anything. Look, what your shop is really about is camp, isn't it? This uh, sort of half-mocking, half-affectionate look at uh, what used to be produced 20, 30 years ago. What was produced 20, 20 years ago is camp. What was produced 60 years ago, like Beardsley, is high fashion. Yes. This is permanent um, camp, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> you can say that. <laughs> Certainly the, the cushions and the, and the tea towels are very high camp, even down to... We've got some Batman and... Robin T-shirts, which is sort of the epitome. Of oh God, help us! Sorry, I'm written. obsessed by the flag. What I would like to know is why uh, you don't put it on the numerous chamber pot. That you've well, we're there. working towards that. Uh, uh, well, uh, you're not being very surrealistic about it all, are you? I mean, it's, that would it's be difficult. Dear. It's difficult to. You get dare not do it. Simply. It's difficult to get the manufacturers to put a flag on a chamber pot. But you really feel you'd like to do it? Oh yes, why not? Where do, where do people buy chamber pots here? What do they use? Do you actually really sell a lot of them? Yes, we do. There's, there's one type that has instructions printed in it, which is very good for serving or using as an ashtray. What's that? Mm -hmm. Which one? It's the super bed pan. What are the instructions? how to use it, actually, <laughs> in case you don't know. Uh, <laughs> but the other chamber pots sell very well to serve tossed salad in and fruit. Hey, do you want to listen to this from the Wonder Book of the Empire? London is the mother city of an empire whose children are scattered under every sky. Upon the king of this nation and his councillors rests a burden such as no other king has ever carried. It is the council chamber of the Commonwealth, to which millions of many races look with love and reverence. There have been many empires, but never one like this. And that was only 30 years ago. Colonial troops are great favorites all along the route. Not today shall we use the high-sounding phrase Commonwealth of Nations. Today we are a family whose lusty sons from the far corners of the earth gather to England's bosom. Lord Kitchener's empire has shrunk to this little measure. Where do you have this stuff made? Um, it's all genuine, you know, military stuff. You know, the majority of it is, you know, some of it is theatrical, but most of it is genuine. Pre genuine? Oh, yes, pre-First World War, most of it. Where do you get it? Ah, it's a military secret. Do your customers come from a certain class, social class? Um, well, let's say when it started, they did. It was more or less the beatniks and, the, you know, these type of people who are always with the long hair who don't mind being stared at. And, but now, you know, it more or less hits everybody, you know, all the, just the ordinary kids, you know, which go to the clubs in London, you know. I have a sort of uh, puritanical reaction against dressing up. I have a big feeling that people dress up not only to have good fun, but also because they uh, long not to be themselves. You've had all this uh, modern rock in uh, England and uh, then the carnival stuff. Now you're going back to prehistory, really. straightforward history. Yeah, well, it's their prehistory. It's Fermidor after the revolution. <laughs> hey, this is very Germanic. Yes, it is Germanic. Um, well, this is the thing, you know, it's... it's I don't, I, don't, I don't think there's any sort of historical element involved. Medal, too, huh? Yeah, yeah a little medal you, that you didn't win. But uh, the, um, it's a matter of prehistory. It's, it's exactly like fancy dress. I remember when I was a kid, I used to go around in my grandfather's pith helmet, and that seemed absolutely remote from me. But the idea of dressing up in my father's Air Force uniform, say, would have, you know, would have, would have, would have been quite unthinkable. <laughs> and all but, these chaps have uh, got a lot of young <laughs> None of them have been in the army. None of them have ever been in the army. They want to it's, go in. I, I, get a, I get a sort of ironic pleasure out of seeing them uh, paying five quid or so for uniforms, which I would have paid 50 quid not to have to wear when I was doing military service. Hey, why, why, why don't they have a United States uniform? They do have United States uniforms. I think they're over there. 
Yeah, but do they sell? Where's John? I don't know whether they sell or not. Yeah, they do. They do. Do all the uniforms sell as much as A lot of people convert them into uniforms. Into German uniforms and that sort Why do they convert them into German uniforms? Do they all want to be little Germans? No, it's quite a fad at the moment, the German uniform being the most prominent of all. Well, is this like this thing that the kids are doing in Southern California, wearing swastikas and... Yes, yeah, the Iron Cross and that sort of thing, you know, very popular. Do you think they've got any sort of fascist or sadistic desires? or? Once the dandy has made it, it can't be done again. A square has taken up. So the dandy must find another gesture. If he hasn't much money, he has to find it cheap. And hence the importance of junk. Five or ten years ago, you could always find something beautiful and well made in Portobello Road and buy it dirt cheap. Now it's mostly junk and tat. The swinging London myth is based on expendability. And nothing is more expendable than fragments of a past which you and your friends don't share. Every brassing stand and lead gnome in the Portobello has a giggle lurking somewhere behind it. Some junk isn't cheap. Old cars, for instance. The beat-up Jag or the 30s Pontiac has a camp value, though it's got no vintage status at all. You have to pay for camp. This mocking but affectionate way of accepting dated things which have no particular real value. And camp transforms the past into theatre. Cars, they're a beautiful example of the way London can strangle itself in its own myth of progress. Ram two million metal boxes into a town plan that was never meant for them, and you instantly have chaos. Nobody laughs but the oil companies. It might be nice to destroy the lot, but that, of course, is only a dream.
London girls are like lollipops. London girls are like tropical fish in a frozen tank. They're really like gazelles. I don't know, here you can, for example, you can wear whatever you want. You know, in Brazil, no, you can't wear very short mini skirts or hats. You can't hear anything. Yes. You, you accept everything. Well, the clothes are more up to date down here, but they tend to be too, um, well, I don't know how to say it, but they, they always seem to wear the same up, up in the north. They don't bother to change, with, to get with it, so to speak. <laughs> I think there's a tremendous search for individuality, which in fact is making us all look exactly the same. Well, I think we're, because we're far ahead in the fashions now, you know, people think of us as swinging city, you know, because Carnaby Street started it off, and so you can walk anywhere now and wear anything you like. Well, uh, yes, I think that you, if you look around, you see lots of girls with short hair, and then in a week's time, they're all wearing freckles, and then the next week, they're all wearing the glasses on their heads or something different. And people now shop to buy dark glasses to put on their heads instead of on their noses. Instead of being told what to think by your parents, you're now told what to think by the magazines and the movies. Well, I'd like to live in Victorian England, and I don't really like London at the moment. When James Boswell came down to London for the first time from Scotland 200 years ago, he wrote, London is undoubtedly a place where men and manners can be seen to the greatest advantage. Here we behold as fine women as were ever created, from the splendid madam down to the civil nymph with white thread stockings who tramps along the strand and will resign her engaging person to your honour for a pint of wine and a shilling. After a moderate share of the pleasures of London, man has a much better chance to make a rational and unprejudiced marriage. Hmm. Don't even need the shilling these days. I think that young people's attitude is only for themselves. I think they care much less for old people now than they used to. I think the home is not an entirety like it used to be. After all, the church and its laws uh, are based on theory and, and uh, this sort of marriage and moral affair is just reverting back to Stone Age more or less, isn't it? Have any woman you want, when you want. And a woman can approach a man on a completely level sexual basis. Of course, she's not going to get pregnant. What is that? Well, women have to be too much like men now, I think. They have to stand up for themselves and so men don't respect women. Please, may I have my book back? I beg your pardon? Is this your book? Yes, it is. I happen not to believe you. I promise you it is. How can you prove it's yours? Well, I left it here on the bench. Can you tell me what's inside? You've been reading it, haven't you? No, I have not. I've just started looking at the pictures. I'm fonder of the pictures than I am of the story. Well, please, may I have my book back? <laughs> what's your name? Mm. Thank you. Bye. All feminine women yes. respond to a certain amount of, well, not necessarily sadism, but certainly the man being in charge of the situation. And I think that's as it should be, and I think that's as it always will be, even if we wear trouser suits every day and every night, and even if we work and earn as much money as the man, I think just instinctively that will be the way round, and it will be. Well, yeah, very 19th century, but uh, lighter.
Yeah. Much like in fact. I like this kind of light, fluffy stuff. It looks good on women. This is one revival I am very much in favor of, actually, Olivia. Yes. Fluffy, fluffy? Fluffy, yeah. fluffy. No, I don't mean the little bit of fluff. I think that's gone out. You don't talk about girls in terms of little bits of fluff anymore. They exist. I don't know. Uh, I associate this fluffiness with uh, a certain type of uh, sensuality. In France, we've had uh, more fashion revolutions than republics in the last few years. <laughs> but <laughs> not, no, no. But nothing quite as sensual as uh, the stuff you get in London. I don't know what it is exactly. It, I may be suffering from the uh, exotic effect when I come over here, but frankly, probably mainly due to clothes, I find uh, London much more sensual than Paris. Uh, Not smarter. I arrived in this country so, uh, five years ago, and uh, then, you know, the, the English were looking terribly drab. And sad. Yes, and, 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 and there was an idea. I mean, I, I, I think one felt it, even if it wasn't, you know, sad to you, you know, that uh, to be pleasurable, you know, was, was not nice. And, and to arrive at the attention, you know, to your body, you know, was also art. But now, I mean, the young people, I mean, uh, leap to be looked at almost. You know, they, to be looked at? Yes. Well, look at only. Uh, but you, but uh, you were asking about, you know, why this should appear sensual in this context. Uh, to me, it appears far more sensual than it does, for instance, at Saint-Tropez, where you have the sun, uh, you have an environment in which you expect people to go around with a minimum of clothing. Uh, in London, uh, the most unnatural possible garment is the miniskirt. It's freezing cold half the time. Yeah, mind uh, you, uh, when it's freezing uh, cold, uh, I would drop it. Well, what is unfair, I mean, to a stranger is to, is to see all these, you know, fantastic, I mean, uh, sort of... Really, I mean, beautiful girls all over the place. And um, how do you make contact with them? I mean, they, it's, uh, you use your wits. Well, what's, uh, uh, but look, there what, is, the, is there not this? What is unfair what? about it? Come on. Well, I mean, there ought to be. We don't want to get into the no, Swedish no, myth. No, in, 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 huh? in Africa, in, in well, South Africa, somewhere Africa happiness goes mm -hmm. um, you can, you can, if, if you are in a train with a, a woman. Where? In, in South Africa, for yes. instance. If you are in a train with a woman, it doesn't matter whether she's uh, terribly ugly. She could be a, as unprepossessing as, as, as possible. But it, it is the duty of the male, you know, to, to make her feel that she's wanted by society. In other words, you know, you have to say, you know, you're, you're beautiful, you know, you... You actually you say flirt. that, do you? Yes, you, you flirt. It's yeah. not supposed to be taken very seriously. I mean, it could turn out to be serious, but you yeah. know, it doesn't have to be. But, I mean, that means that the society creates opportunities for contact. And you don't, you don't feel that, you know, you're irrelevant, you know, to other people. Um, and here, I mean, you're, you're looking at a, at a beautiful person and, and you just want to go and tell her, you know, look, I think you're stunning. And the society has created so, much, so many inhibitions, you know, you can't do that because it's considered rude. And what a style-setting clique somewhere in Chelsea is doing. So what happens is fashions get anonymous. They turn into a new sort of conformity. But you know, Bob, not only are the suburbs dreary, even the so-called gay swinging London still lacks amenities like the European style cafe where you can meet practically everybody. Yeah, I, I, it does. I don't think the pub's much of a substitute for that, do you? 
No, as a matter of fact, my main fantasy is waking up one morning to find London littered with that kind of cafe where I can rub shoulders with practically anybody I admire, famous and infamous. <laughs> But what we're all determined to do is to see that Britain can advance industrially without lurching into bargains. I'm sure that uh, our meeting will have made a great difference to friendly cooperation. Unfortunately, I think we're a dying country. And it's uh, like Rome just before the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Yes. I think so. Unfortunately, it's so, but uh, I think it's marvellous to live here now. But I don't feel there's any... Any hope for the future, really, for England? Well, I think so. More, probably more of a freer, a freer life these days. Ah, yes. I mean, I'll pick up uh, on that. Yes, freer life. Yes. And I think the reason yes. for this is that people are bunging in uh, as much as they can do in in one particular time. Than, yes, uh, I agree with you. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you've got a threat of a nuclear war hanging over you. So people say, well, let's live for the present. Damn it. No, I can't find something in London at all, actually. It's in the shop windows, but it's not in the streets. It seems very exciting when you don't live here, but as soon as you get here, it's, it's, it's exciting, I think. I think that um, it's, it's missed just, just to say hey, that uh, oh, it's London swinging, but um, if you really bring this down, there is one small section of the community, there's a few young people that have a certain way of life. Yes. That's all you can say about it. Good. After all, you know, people who live in that kind of place, Dreary suburbias. How swinging are they, in fact? Yes, but there are some guys like um, Arnold Wesker, for instance, who are trying to do something to put a little bit of cultural leaven into that mass. Mm -hmm. But it appears uh, uh, that Arnold Wesker is not just interested in providing the conventional type of theatre. Uh, that he, he wants to put into this new building is what? Uh, theatre, restaurants, uh, galleries, and just places to sit and think in, if you can think. Arnold uh, Wesker, as a playwright uh, with a social message, it seems to me that one of your central ideas was that uh, you hoped socialism in this country would result in a certain amount of loosening up of the society, a certain amount of color, a certain amount of vitality. Do you feel that uh, your hopes have been realized in the present generation of Englishman, or do you see what is going on as a kind of perversion of your hopes? You, you straight away put your finger on something that that, uh, that I'm terribly confused about. Uh, as a as a writer, you'll you'll know that secretly, when one writes plays like Chicken Soup, one would love people to go out and start a revolution immediately. Uh, they don't. Uh, the, the reasons behind writing a play like Chicken Soup are, are many. Um, one was because all of us were aware in, uh, in that period of the terrible grayness and drabness of not only life but particularly socialist attitudes. And it seemed to me that the, the early spirit of socialism that I was familiar with, and one doesn't want to to, to, to hang on to the past for the sake of the past, but that it did contain a kind of spirit and, uh, uh, and uh, a wish for colour and the developing of all those, that marvellous potential that human beings had. But it took years for me to, to discover um, a very important thing about art, and that is that its effect, I think a lot of us are only just realising this, that the effect of art just isn't immediate. It's accumulative, and it takes its effect over generations. But is this what is happening now amongst the young people? Is this part of the accumulation? Now, about this, I'm not sure. On the one hand, one looks at those pop programs on television and sees, the, sees those lovely faces of youngsters, and you think, my God, there is the new generation. How marvelous. It's all, it's all going to happen. Um, and you see Carnaby Street and you think, yes, there's colour, there's, there, there's movement, there's a, the, the, there's a breakthrough of some sort. And then you look closely at the Carnaby Street clothes 
and they're tatty mm. and they don't last long and there's something ephemeral about all that's happening well, and then when the sorry just to finish and then when the beatles are exploited in the way they are and one thinks of what the beatles could have done um what could they have done they have such an extraordinary position in society that there's almost nothing that they couldn't have done from from the the, the harnessing of uh, uh, of the money of youngsters to send to underdeveloped countries or, or starvation areas to the creation of a dozen centers like this i mean with a snap of their fingers they could have done so much but they have a kind of uh, they've developed a kind of the coolness the coolness which was intended to be a rebellion against the establishment has has, has developed into a cynicism. All I do know is that there is a, there is inherent in, uh, in English society, this mechanism for rendering impotent by applause, everything, um, everything new and exciting that happens. like this one. Nothing is as cool as a Negro on the dance floor. Not that there is anything special about a colored club, but what Negroes have done is to smuggle in a more direct sensuality and a certain sharpness and grace. Let's go and see if he's in. Candidly, frankly, how do you feel about the new gay London? Well, um, it's all that new. I have once every ten years, on you... average, my experience. But how does it compare with the uh, London of the, uh, of the bright young things before the war? Well, it's on a much larger scale. There are great air, there are a great many more people. Mm -hmm. Places are much mm -hmm. more crowded and, and um, less intimate, as it were. And secondly, of course, uh, the young, a larger section of the young, and they have got far more money than they had mm -hmm. in, in the 20s. Now, how do you feel about that? 
Well, I'm always pleased and I'd like everybody having money. So, what is the fuss about? You know, why, what's all this stuff about swinging London, according to you? Well, I think it's a, a phenomenon that occurs about once every ten years or so. Not about London, surely. There's, oh, yes, you know, there's always need a right to start off what is wrong with the youth of today. I mean, a number of times I've heard what's wrong with the youth of today. I mean, 1919 onwards. Yeah, what did they say then? Way, what did they say know, after 1919? Living in pleasure, living for pleasure, no sense of responsibility. I mean, all. It was the same know, theme? It was the same theme. Well, only then, of course, combined, combined to a far smaller section of the population. That's it. The uh, pleasure ride has gone down now. Yes, I mean, it's, it's spread. Did it have the uh, very strong, uh, well, sexual implications then that it has today? Um, I was always thought to have, I don't. Yes, but that is, that is a change. I mean, the word, the four-letter words now occur everywhere in print. I mean, uh, no, those are words. Be, what about yes. the facts? Well, I think I've always um, held very firmly to the view that um, any period in the world's history, the amount of adultery, fornication, and homosexuality that goes on remains absolutely constant. Uh -huh. The only thing that changes is people's attitudes to it and the amount they say about it or talk about it. And how do the attitudes in the 20s and in the 60s compare? Well, I mean, uh, now, I mean, this is much more permissive. I mean, anything goes. But, um, and the point is that, and that, that, that song, Anything Goes, was written in the 30s. And are you for or against it on the whole? Well, I get awfully bored. I mean, bored by what? Well, I mean, you know, stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples. Well, I'm sick of sex. I mean, really, it's, it's, <laughs> it's every paper you open. I mean, there's a somebody or other. I mean, um, Miss Bridget Brophy is discussing technique for the young, or I mean, really. Or what do you object to there? My body's just cracking off a ball. <laughs> I'm not that interested in what other people do in bed. I mean, let them, let them get on with it. I don't really want to want to uh, have every paper always full of more sexual advice. I mean, the amount of advice this generation's had about sex, I wonder if they ever get down to tour. Yes. Now, of course, you've lost the empire now. And we've and, uh, and, um, ah, and they oh, have we've lost the empire. Uh, what I want to ask you yeah. is, uh, has this loss of empire and the notion of going abroad for the young men, you know, to, you know, for duty, oh, yes. you know, to other people, has it made the English to turn more inward toward themselves and to, to think more about the pleasures of the body, about the, the pleasures of life? I think there probably is a sort of glorious feeling that um, the white man's burden is now off one's shoulders. <laughs> that one need no longer maintain. Because uh, this, this would reduce Kipling to tears. Yes. You know, the people are watching one the whole time. I mean, what, what, what will the locals think? I mean, I think that is a... It had a very, very liberating influence, I think. Mm. Mm. I've always associated the English in London with a kind of calm madness, some form of uh, accepted eccentricity. I still find it here. The London fashion bubbling is part of a cycle. I think it'll wash away. Now, people here don't strike me as being more permissive or wilder than in Paris. Their manners are definitely easier, freer, less hypocritical than in the post-war London I knew. Then, for a student, what to do in the evening was quite a problem. I think that London has now the vitality, the colour, and even a new extravagance that I like. There is that nervous expectation that something exciting is about to happen in the next pub or street corner. But the buildings and the squares remain, and so do the institutions. Old London stays recognisable. No discotheque can really change that. The energies of New London, whether they're creative or, at the other side, merely anarchic, seem larger when you see them against this traditional backdrop. People talk about a revolution, but below the surface, very little has changed. 